Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the Wool Academy podcast. This is episode 126 and today I'm being joined by Nan Bray. She is farming sheep in Tasmania under the brand White Gum Wool and in addition to just growing wool she also creates knitting yarns out of her wool and I unfortunately didn't get to talk much about her uh, business related to the knitting yarn so I do hope you will check out her website White Gum Wool um, and find out more about that but Nan and I had a really inspirational conversation at least I found it very inspirational because throughout her career and also once she started sheep farming she questioned how things were usually done and then found a way that would work best for her sheep and for her land and also for herself. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. And she does things a little bit different than, than I guess, the majority of the industry. Um, but I thought it was a really nice story to tell, to see um, how yeah, you find your way of growing wool. I do hope you enjoy this episode and I'll talk to you again at the end. Bye for now. So I'm really pleased to finally get to talk to you, Nan. Um, welcome to the Wool Academy podcast. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Elizabeth. <laughs> and yeah, I think the best point for us to start is if you give a short introduction to yourself and also tell us a little bit about your farm white, and your business, White Gum Wool. Okay, um, so I started the farm, I bought the farm in uh, 2000. So I've been farming for 20 years. Before that, I was a climate scientist and oceanographer. So this is my second career. And uh, the farm is um, it's a thousand acres and I run about 500 sheep on it. Um, when I started, I really knew absolutely nothing about farming. I thought I knew a little bit, but I didn't. And I thought it would be pretty easy and it wasn't. So the first, oh, certainly the first 12 years were really pretty hard. Um, and I tried to farm sheep the way that it's, that the sort of conventional farming systems in Australia, because I didn't know uh, anything. So, you know, start there. But I kept running up against things that didn't work for me either um, in terms of my sense of what was right for the animals or the landscape or me personally. And so I started adapting um, and experimenting. And my science background was really useful because I wasn't afraid of experimenting. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and it's, um, I was in a reasonably good financial position when I started. Uh, by the end of 10 years, I wasn't anymore, but I did have a bit of funds behind me because of my previous job. So I felt like I could take risks a bit that might be, you know, financially a bit tricky. And um, yeah, so it's been a very evolutionary process, sometimes faster than evolution, <laughs> sometimes pretty radical. Um, but uh, by the time I started uh, having my fiber made into knitting yarn, which was in 2013, I had pretty much set in place the basic principles that I was trying to use in terms of farming. And happily for me, those principles, which are very, um, very much around animal welfare and, and environmental sustainability, resonated with the people that I was trying to sell yarn to. So that was, that was really happy for me because I didn't, had never found a community of farmers in Australia who had uh, much of any use for what I was trying to do. So, so the, the, the time since 2013 till now has been one of, um, well, another learning curve because I didn't know how to, anything about how yarn was made or how to market it or any of those things. I just kind of jumped into it. But it was, um, there was an underlying feeling that the people that I was selling to actually really do care about the way I manage my my sheep and my property and that was just amazingly restoring for me and what made you decide to to start 
the second career in sheep farming? What was your motivation? Well, I had started training um, border collies uh, to do, basically to do competitions when I lived in San Diego and worked at the University of California. And there aren't a lot of sheep in Southern California. So uh, I didn't really have an opportunity to use them in a true working situation. But uh, backing up a little bit, both my parents grew up on farms, but during the Great Depression. So they both rejected farming as a way of making a living. And, but I always kind of liked the idea and I particularly was entranced with the idea of working dogs. So that was my sort of my breakout thing when I was being a scientist. And uh, by about 1995, I guess, I'd realized I didn't really want to go on doing research, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I came to Australia, to Tasmania, to visit some colleagues. And uh, I realized that I could actually have a small farm and a few sheep and bring my dogs and still have a job that you know paid my salary. So that I moved here in the end, I moved here in 1997. Um, I had to get a job you know, with one of the big government agencies in order to get um, permanent residency to be able to emigrate. And, uh, but it was really, okay, I could have a few sheep and, and my dogs in a farm and a job. And that seemed like um, at least a, a holding pattern until I figured out what I wanted to do. And so partway through that, job, I had a five-year term, I decided very rashly to buy the farm and um, thinking that I could just get someone to manage it while I went on doing my fairly intensive job. And that was, so there were three years that were really tough because I was trying to do two, two things, two major things at once. Um, but I, I got through that. And then I sort of gradually realized over the succeeding couple of years that that was enough. I didn't want to do another academic career or a career in government or policy or anything like that. I just wanted to farm. So I did. And I farmed until basically until kind of until I ran out of money. And uh, but also we hit several really, really bad years, low, very low rainfall years. And the combination was like, I'm, I'm losing money hand over fist. I'm working my tail off. I have to, something has to change. I can't go on doing it this way. And so I started changing the production things. Um, and the, the, this, the first thing, the first major thing I changed had to do with nutrition. And that's still kind of the core. So we'll come back to the nutrition stuff. Um, but I also realized that no matter how efficient I got in terms of my production system, I still couldn't make ends meet. Um, the, the price for raw wool just isn't high enough. You don't get to control it. I don't get to say, okay, I'll sell you my wool for this much. Somebody bids for it at auction. And so I, I, at the scale I was farming, there was no way I could make ends meet. So that was when I decided to move up the supply chain and, and start having yarn made from my fiber and then selling that myself. And that's worked really well, I have to say, financially. Um, it's put me, actually, I'm very few farmers, uh, at least at my scale in Australia, pay tax. Most farms at this scale are supported in great part by a partner who is working outside the farm. Um, and I certainly didn't pay tax until about three years ago. So <laughs> that's sort of my indication that at least financially, I'm on the right track. <laughs> yeah, that I like, I, I had that view. That's also that if I have to pay a lot of taxes, it also means I, I earn enough money. Yes. And that's a good that's sign. That's right. Way, yeah. That's a good sign. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, before we dive a little bit more into how you farm and what's so special about uh, white gum wool, tell me a little bit more about Tasmania, because obviously you, you chose to go to Tasmania and not somewhere else. So tell me a little bit yeah. more. Um, well, I, when I first came here to visit, I was supposed to stay for a week and work with some colleagues. And I, got, I had the chance to drive around. Actually, a friend of mine had a motorcycle. And so he took me to various parts of the state. And I just fell in love with the state. So I stayed for another week so that I could do some more traveling. I think um, there were several reasons. One is that uh, it's 
it's got a tremendously varied geography. So it reminded me actually a lot of the state that I was born in that my parents grew up in, which is Idaho, which has Rocky Mountains, it has desert, deserty sort of sagebrush plains. Um, it's got some areas where there's uh, a lot of cropping that's done. Uh, but you, you know, within the space of a couple of hours, you move through very different um, areas. And Tasmania has, doesn't have really high mountains, but it has World Heritage uh, protected areas, old growth forests, um, beautiful coastlines, beaches with almost nobody on them, even before the pandemic. <laughs> And, um, and then areas like my area is sort of semi-arid, and then the East Coast is really quite dry. Um, then there's cropping in the South. And so it's, it's uh, almost all of it is physically quite beautiful and there's a lot of variety. Um, the other thing is that there aren't a lot of people. There's, there's only 500,000 people in the state. So the Density of population is pretty low, and I found that pretty appealing too. After living in cities most of my life, I thought, no, I could live in a place like this. <laughs> yeah, I also now just recently moved to the countryside, and I enjoy that as well. Like no traffic jams, and yeah, you can you can walk for some time without meeting anyone. So I, th I found no, that's, that that's right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, and I mean, I live near a very small town. And uh, there's never a problem with parking. Yeah, that's uh, what know, my mom always to, says. Yeah, there's always. You know, a if you have to go <laughs> a half block farther, is about the worst. You know, so. Um, but th I mean, there there also is no nighttime restaurant open. So, if you, it kind of depends on what matters to you. But that didn't matter to me at all. Having the having the peace and the tranquility was really what I was after. Yeah. I've actually been to Tasmania, but only for one day and I think one night. So very, very short, but I also had a really uh, beautiful time there and I can understand why you chose uh, to stay there. Now let's and, talk. You know, look, oh, sorry. The, oh, sorry. The other thing I was going to say, Elizabeth, is that in my previous career, I did a huge amount of traveling. And so I've seen a lot of places in the world and I have never found a place that I thought was more beautiful than and welcoming than <laughs> Tasmania. So, um, you know, it wasn't just like, oh, this is a beautiful place. It's like, oh no, this is really special. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Now, sometimes you arrive someplace and you know, now you've finally arrived home or you finally found That's where right. you're supposed to be. Yeah, I know that yeah. feeling as well. Now, um, so let's now talk about wool. Um, <laughs> so your wool production you describe on your website is like relies on three commitments that you made and that's excellent in excellence in nutrition and conservation land ethic and thoughtful animal welfare so if you don't mind we'll just go through each of these three commitments and you'll tell me a okay. little bit more so what does excellence in nutrition mean to you how do you implement it so uh, the nutrition issue arose after the really bad three-year period of drought that we had the <clears throat> and in the um, third year of the drought, I tried something called a drought lot, which is like a makeshift feedlot. So the idea is that you keep the animals confined, you feed them everything they need in the, it, with hay and grain, and you keep them confined until at least six weeks after it rains so that the paddocks have a chance to, to recover. And uh, it's kind of, it's, I found it really scary because I wasn't sure that I was giving them enough um, I did a lot of research and, you know, but um, in fact, what I learned through that process um, was that they were, I, they had enough to eat, certainly. They were really quite fat, but they weren't healthy. And I had, um, I had a couple, I think, just literally die of heart attacks in the yards. <laughs> I was like, okay, what was that? And then, um, when I let them out, it was lambing not too long after I let them out. So they were pregnant in the yards and I had tremendous problems with lambing that year um, with particularly with uterine prolapse, which is just awful in sheep. It's very hard to fix. And um, so, yeah, it was really quite a nightmare. And I, so I thought, well, hang on, this isn't, this is not good nutrition. Um, 
but I really didn't know very much about it. And just almost really by uh, by accident, I found out about some research that was being done in the US, had been being done in the US for years by a man named Fred Provenza, who's a professor at Utah State. He's now retired. And what his research uh, showed over the years was that um, animals and plants in the, that are that have sort of co-evolved in a system have um, have a relationship which derives from chemicals in the plants. So the plants um, have chemical defenses which keep the sheep from overeating that plant. The, the chemi chemical defenses are called secondary compounds. And they um, basically, if it, so a secondary compound is like, it's secondary because it's not like a protein or a carbohydrate. It's a sophisticated uh, chemical that is like a tannin or an alkaloid, um, things like that, which are essentially pharmaceuticals. But as an example that I often use when I talk about this is um, tea has a lot of tannin in it. And if you drink too much tea, your system knows it. it you actually, your stomach feels slightly upset or if you drink way too much tea, you'll get really upset. That those signals, your body is able to connect the way it feels after you've, a few hours after you've eaten, consumed something to the smell of what you ate before then. And so what animals learn over time is I can eat this much, but no more of that plant. I need to move to another plant. And so what that does is, is two things, it keeps, the plants from being eaten all the way to the ground, <clears throat> excuse me, but it also means that the animals are, are able to, to nourish themselves more adequately because they're moving from plant to plant to plant. So the more I looked at, it, at that as a set of concepts, the more sense it made to me, especially after my drought lot experience, because that just so didn't work. And, and, and when I look back to the drought lot, I was feeding them grain, lupins, which are a legume, and um, hay. That was it. That was all they had. And so that does not count as uh, diversity in nutrition. Um, so I started, so, and the other part of that uh, sort of equation, nutrition equation, is that, um, yes, there's a, uh, what they call an autonomic response. So your body can make that connection, but there's also a learned element. And the learning element is that you got to know where the plants are in the landscape and you have to have exposure and experience knowing what that plant's going to do for you. So the learning process is actually between mothers and babies, principally peer to peer. So youngsters also teach each other, but if you've got ewes that really know the landscape are locally adapted to the landscape, then they're the ones who teach their, their progeny. And that process takes two to three years. Whereas conventional sheep farming, you would be weaning babies and taking them away from not just their mothers, but all the adults in the flock, because they could learn from other adults as well, um, at three months. So the very first thing I did, well, I did a couple of things. So one more thing uh, with the with the plant stuff is that if once you understand that animals are going to be seeking out diversity in their in the production system, then what you fairly quickly realize is that you can't overgraze because they're going to eat the diversity first and then all that'll be left is grass and then they'll eat the grass. So if you want diversity in your system, you really have to back off the grazing pressure, which means reducing the number of sheep. So that's what I did the first year. I took the numbers way down. I think I had 250 or 300 sheep after that really bad drought lot year. And um, so that to give the, the diversity a chance to, to build back up and I didn't wean, I just stopped weaning. So what happened uh, within a very short time was I realized that I wasn't having trouble with intestinal parasites anymore. So one of the things that was happening through that combination of all they wanted to eat and a good choice set of choices, they were in fact getting what they needed to keep 
the intestinal parasites from getting out of control. So I, I would test, I tested all the time during those years. Um, there were still worms, intestinal worms, but they never were out of control. So that really convinced me I was on the right track with the, with the nutritional stuff. And then over the succeeding years, that was in 2009 that I started that. Then I just kept really trying to work out how many sheep could I run without it being overgrazed? It's really variable weather conditions from year to year. So, you know, what does that mean in terms of total numbers? Um, do I just sell sell sheep right away if I think that I need to? Um, you know, so I did a lot of experimenting around that. But the goal was always to maintain a level of abundance that would keep a level of diversity in the paddocks and. Um, yeah, so I, I got it right oh, probably two thirds of the time and screwed it up at least a third of the time during that those years. And then later on for other reasons, um, I chose to just reduce the flock level to where I thought it, I could keep it year in, year out so that I didn't have to be trying to sell, sell off sheep. You never wanna be selling sheep into a falling market, which is what happens if you're, you know, if you're, so anyway. Um, that's, that's the, is that the nutrition story? Is that, did that make enough sense to you? Yes, it did. It's super interesting. And, and I thought, okay, you said the sheep and the, the lamb, they, they need to learn. And that takes two, three years, like where can they feed on what? But you also had to learn, no, where on my <laughs> farm is actually which uh, type of yeah, plant it, and in, and I will say, Elizabeth, my, my scientist side kind of got in the way because my first reaction was, okay, I need to know what secondary compounds are in which plants. Because I had gone, I went to the US and I took Fred's two week course that he te used to teach each summer. So I had a lot of knowledge in an academic sense, but then I had to come back and try to apply it. And the thing is that it's actually very expensive to analyze a plant for its secondary compounds. And of course, nobody has done that for any native Tasmanian plants. So um, I, I, was, I really struggled with this. I was like, I have to know because I have to teach the sheep. And finally, I realized that I didn't actually need to know. The sheep needed to know. All I needed to know was where was the diversity? And that's, a, that's at a macro level. So that was a that was a really interesting moment because I really had to let go of the scientist side of me uh, that wanted to know and control to go no no your job is to help them be in the places where there's diversity and their job is to figure out as individual animals what what they need out of that and that's really what led to the shepherding uh, work that I did that was all of us kind of learning together how to be locally adapted. But I think we'll get, we'll come back to that. A bit yeah, I just on. wanted to say that, that, that definition just sounds like good shepherding, that you just lead <laughs> them to where, uh, but then they'll figure it out on their own kind of. Yeah, yeah they, they, need, they need the time there and they need the repetitions because how you feel one day isn't how you feel another. Like today it was really cold here and it's been very warm and summery, and and um, I had a I had a salad planned for dinner tonight, and I went, oh, maybe I'll have soup. So I had mm -hmm. to sort of dust around. Could I find everything that I needed to make soup? Um, but I, you know, it's like that. You don't necessarily want or need the same things day after day. So, and the and diversity in a natural system is patchy. So a learning where it is, as well as, you know, making it connecting to what your body wants. Um, it's tricky. It's hard work. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So the next one is uh, like, you talk about conservation land ethics. So what do you mean by that? And how do you implement that on your farm? So that's a term that comes from um, a wonderful conservationist um, in the U.S. who uh, worked and wrote in the 30s, 40s, and 50s by the name of Aldo Leopold. In fact, he was one of the men who found, founded the Wilderness Society in the US. He was uh, a forester by trade, by training, 
Um, and but eventually he came to realize that the way that farming was being done more generally in the US was about farmers dominating the land rather than working with nature and, and respecting the way that nature works. So uh, I think it, even his forestry stuff, he realized that the way that he'd been trained wasn't really the way that the that the natural world needed things to to go. So he he did a couple of things. He wrote a series of essays called the Sand County Almanac, which are very approachable personal stories about his own little um, sand farm in Wisconsin, I think it is, um, which was kind of the family weekend place. But uh, they're beautiful stories and stories of his past life, uh, is, you know, his earlier life uh, that talk that he doesn't actually use the conservation land ethics language in those. They're just beautiful stories, but they are um, emblematic of what he was thinking of. And then he went on to write a lot of essays about the conservation ethic, land ethic, and um, this, what he refers to as the, um, I'm not quite sure how to say it, um, Abrahamic, as in Abraham, um, approach to land, which is that, you know, this is a gift that God gave us as humans, and we have to to, to dominate it and use it for our, our, our own use and, and our good. And, and so he was really challenging that and saying, well, hang on, um, in, in order to be useful to us, it has to be have its own internal integrity. And if we keep on doing what we're doing, we're destroying that integrity, which eventually will destroy us. And so I, uh, I first read his books when I was probably about your age, maybe a bit younger and uh, in college and just was just, you know, really amazed by it and, and, and touched by the stories, but also intellectually by the ideas. And um, not long after I bought the farm, I having completely forgotten about Aldo Leopold, I came across my old copy of his book and went and read it and just, you know, just cried. I was like, oh, you know, this is, this is actually, it had been so influential, but it, I'd internalized it. And when I got to read it again, it was like finding a friend, you know, it's like, going, yep, 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 yep. So what that means in terms of, you know, practical on the ground stuff has been a lot of what I've been sorting through for the last 15 years or so, 10, 15 years. But it really, it starts, I think, with a, um, a view, you know what, my kitty cat just woke up and decided she's going to, she's going to participate. I might, um, when she jumps up, That's okay. she can say hi. We can, yeah, we can we'll... meet her too. <laughs> okay. I have a dog um, who barks from time to time, so we're an animal <laughs> friendly podcast. <laughs> so it's, it's about, um, it's really about finding a humility, I think, in yourself that the land, yes, I own the title to this land, but it doesn't actually belong to me. Hmm. Um, here she comes. <laughs> this is Sky. Sky Kitty, you can say hello. She has this feeling that when I'm talking like this, it, I must be talking to her. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who's, on the, who's on the screen? Do you see who's on the screen? <laughs> no, it's okay. She go walk off. Um, so, a lot of the things that I've learned over the years with the sheep and the farm have been uh, ways to alter my internal state, the, the, what I'm, the way I bring myself into it. Um, and I, the, so for instance, with shepherding, um, I realized after several many failed attempts to get the sheep to do what I was trying to get them to do, that I was, I was moving at a pace that had nothing to do with the way they move through the world. And so I thought, okay, all right, all right, I gotta be more patient, gotta be more patient. And then I realized actually, if I'm being consciously being patient, then that means I have inside of me the seeds of impatience that I'm fighting. 
So I have to go back yet another step. And in shepherding, I refer to that as, as entering sheep time and actually being there in the, their sense of time, which has nothing to do with our sense of time. So there's a similar kind of thing with regard to the land ethic. It's, it's really about um, entering into um, a feeling for the land, which isn't, it's not an ideology, it's not a romanticism, it's, um, it's, a, it's kind of an acceptance that, that, that there is an intrinsic value in the land um, and in the landscape um, that is worth, preserving isn't quite the right word, but um, honoring, I guess, is the way I would say it. Um, it's, it sounds very philosophical and it, I suppose it is, but what it does then is that allows me, that allows me to make decisions which are aligned I think better with what needs to happen in the landscape rather than working from the, okay, well, this is what I think should happen. And then, and then being more, there is, there's certainly an intellectual component to it, but uh, underlying that intellectual component, I think is this connection to, to the land as its own entity that deserves to be yeah, to be honored, I guess, is the best word I can come up with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I find a lot of other wood growers I've talked to, they also see themselves like more like that they don't own the land, but they're like the stewards or the, con um, yeah, I guess stewardship. But, but then they, I think, often see it that they're just taking care of the land for the next generation of their family. Mm. But... I think the difference with you is that you're taking care of the land for the sake of the land and you're honoring that's the right. land, so to say. Yeah, that's right. Um, and because I don't have children, so I don't have a next generation literally for the farm, but uh, but I, the, what I'm talking about here, you know, if we were doing it everywhere on the globe, then the next generation of humans would would be the those who, that you would be doing it for, mm. that you're maintaining, um, or attempting, doing your best to maintain the integrity of the, of the whole system. Yeah. And, and, and you don't always get it right. You know, you do things and you think, oh, okay, yep, 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 yep. And then it's like, well, no. <laughs> I think the hardest part, honestly, is that when you start to make changes, the system changes and you, you know, so you succeed in that way. But then that means that what you need to do next is not what you just did. So you have to keep adapting and paying attention. And that's, I think, where those underlying principles really help. Because instead of there being a, a set of rules, there's, there are these sort of underlying things which um, motivate the way the whole thing works. And if you can keep your mind on that, then you have a better chance of keeping up with the changes that nature is going to throw at you. Yeah. So if, for instance, I've been really working hard to not overgraze. You need to graze a bit because otherwise you, do, you lose diversity if you don't graze at all. That's not really an issue. But one of the things I've noticed just in this year, which has been a tremendous rainfall year for us, well, compared to the last few anyway, mm -hmm. is that there are areas where the, um, the, the, it's not really leaf litter, it's sort of the the dead plant material that's still attached into the soil is heavy enough that um, new annual growth isn't coming up through it. And I've never really noticed that before this year. So now I'm kind of going, okay, uh, that's, there are, you know, there's discussions about how you disturb the, the surface of the soil so that you get better growth. Um, and I've never really, bought into that before because I hadn't seen it. So one of the things I'm contemplating this year, this winter is doing some cool weather burning to see if I can remove that sort of shell of plant material and um, let, let some other things loose. So, you know, if, if you'd told me five years ago that I was gonna have that kind of problem, I would have 
rolled my <laughs> eyes. So that's the kind of thing you just have to go, okay, right. I've taken these steps and things have changed and now I'm going to have to adapt to the next thing. Now you have new problems <laughs> to, to look at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And the last uh, principle a commitment you you are talking about thoughtful animal welfare and I've, i don't think i've ever seen the combination of thoughtful and animal welfare and that <laughs> i find really intriguing so tell me more <laughs> okay well um that also is a bit of an evolution um uh when i very first started uh I was told that my sheep had to be mules. And when I when I was explained to me what mulesing is, which I presume your most of your podcast listeners will know, I just went, no, we won't be doing that. And they said, oh, well, you have to because of fly strike. And also nobody will buy your surplus sheep if they aren't mules. And I had a wonderful stockman working with me at the time who had been retired, came out of retirement to help me for a few months and stayed with me for 13 years. He's still going, he's 94, uh, just had a birthday. And I, and I actually, he came up for a farm visit last week. So he's, he's doing surprisingly well for his age, but he's, he was opposed to mulesing from the time it started. He was very much a lone voice. So when I, I asked him, I, you know, I was kind of like, well, I don't want to do it. Oh, I know what the, the wool agent said to me, well, you don't have to do it. We'll get a contractor to do it. And I said, no, you're not hearing me. <laughs> I don't want this done to my sheep. And, um, but David said, no, we can manage it. So I said, right, we'll manage it. And I will say, I've never had, I never had trouble selling sheep. So that wasn't an issue. And if you manage the, uh, the application of uh, fly, um, deterrent chemical, which I use an organic compound called extinisad for that, um, and crutching to take the breech wool away. Um, I just, yeah, there are uh, usually, you know, most years I have a touch of fly in a few sheep, but it's not something that's, you know, it's not widespread and it's not fatal. Um, so you absolutely can manage it. So that was kind of my first foray into, well, just because somebody said you had to do it that way doesn't mean you do. And, but the next one was um, really coming up again, up with the, you know, with the nutritional excellence thing. I realized that giving animals choice in what they eat actually ought to appear as an animal right. I, I really feel that. It hasn't yet made the list of animal rights, but I, you know, I think that we should be trying to maximize animal health, the individual health, the health of individual animals rather than the number of animals we're trying to produce. And you know, if people shift gears, it's amazing what happens in terms of animal health. So that was, you know, in the early days of the nutritional stuff, I was still kind of grappling with that and getting getting a hold of it. But um, once I got the nutrition right, and I didn't have intestinal parasites, I didn't have sheep that were scouring, scouring or getting daggy. Then I, the next thing I did was, was like, well, why don't we leave the tails on? Why do we take the tails off? And the reason is because sheep get daggy and the poo gets sort of painted on the, their hocks by the tails and everybody gets really unhappy about it, not surprisingly. But by the time, by that point, I didn't have that problem. And so in fact, as it's turned out, the sheep use their tails to swish flies, just like horses do. So I stopped tail docking. And um, about that time, I was actually, it was before I stopped tail docking, I started looking at animal welfare policies across around the world, because I thought, you know, I don't think everybody docks tails. I th and it's true, it's not, it's not allowed in Europe, it's not allowed in the UK, unless you have a very good reason why you need to. Um, for docking sheep's tails. And so I thought, ooh, 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 this could, this is gonna get the industry here sooner or later. We're gonna be up against the tail docking issue. And so, but one of the things that annoyed the living daylights out of me was that the animal welfare policies were all books, you know I mean? Like hundreds of pages of stuff. And I thought, no, I think I could write an animal welfare policy that takes a page. I could do this. So I did. And admittedly, it was, you know, really tailored to my farm, but it made me then really stop and think about, 
okay, well, what are the issues around animal welfare that I think are really important? And that's where the thoughtful animal welfare thing came <laughs> from. Um, so choice, I mean, obviously the basic five freedoms, no, no thing about that. Um, the, one of the things that I learned once I started leaving the babies with their mothers and then eventually running the whole flock as a, as a single unit, other than the rams, um, was how strong the social structure is. The social cohesion is huge. And that's really, really important to the animals. It's important to their health. Um, and I think their happiness, you know, that's a hard thing to prove. But I, I really notice, um, and other people have noticed this as well, my sheep are very quiet. They don't call. And it's because they're all together. Mm -hmm. And when, when they're grazing, if you look on a, an, a, a normal, a conventional farm where you've got year classes of sheep in, in groups, they just scatter through a paddock to graze. Mine don't. They all kind of graze together and they, there'll be a leading edge, but they're just grazing along. You know, they, they really stay together. Um, they're, it's, it's quite, uh, it's honestly, it's really quite amazing to me to see that. And I, so I think that's another element in this thoughtful animal welfare thing. And then, um, and then that sort of the most recent thing where they came, it sort of came out of shepherding, but I, through the shepherding process, I got to be really good friends with my sheep. And I just realized I didn't want to send them off for slaughter. I just didn't want to do it. So as I often did have done over the years, I just made that decision, I'm not going to do it. And then I, then I started figuring out, well, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> how, do, how do I fix it? And, and by the time I made that decision, I was, uh, the yarn business was, was uh, flourishing pretty well. So I had the financial wherewithal to make that choice because uh, particularly with meat prices, the way they are, have been for the last few years, um, most farms uh, wool, wool growing entities, well, most sheep growing entities are, I would say two thirds of their income is, or better has come, is coming from meat. So a choice not to slaughter your sheep is a really significant financial one. Um, I, I just made it because it felt right. And so, um, so, and it, it, it does have some interesting implications, which the, then my science side could kind of come up against and go, all right, well, you know, what do we do about this? What do we do about that? Um, so there, those are things like what happens to the wool as the animal ages, how old will sheep get on average? Um, because that's, that speaks to, you know, what your replacement numbers are. Um, by the time I'd reached this point, I had decided, um, that I needed to really try to keep, um, the numbers down so that I, I didn't, I wasn't going to supplementary feed anymore. I gave that away pretty early on. So I needed the environment to be able to support the animals without me selling any because I wasn't going to sell any. So I kind of, you know, put myself in a little bit of a box, but I thought if I keep the numbers down low enough, then I should be okay. And that so far that has proven to be the case. Um, but so then, you know, because we normally slaughter our sheep at about six or seven years, maximum, nobody knows what the average age is going to be. And Merinos tend to be longer lived than the British breeds. But um, so my oldest sheep, Alice, who's the one on the yarn band, mm -hmm. um, she was the one who sort of taught me about uh, nutrition. I'll come back to that story at some point. Um, uh, she lived to be 16. And she died last year. And uh, and then my next oldest ones, I think are 12 now. So she was, she was special. She'd, I'd kept her, mm -hmm. um, of her because, because of her story. But, um, so I've been tracking the wool of individual sheep. So I've got 20 sheep that all have names. And so every year I take a sample from each of those. And, um, so I'm, I'm actually getting a, a, a time history on an individual animal of what happens to their wool as they as they get older. As long as the nutrition is good, it doesn't, it really doesn't change. Alice, Alice's last fleece when she was 15 was a little bit shorter than her previous one. 
just as fine, just as um, you know, just as much of it, just as fine. so. I'm I've there is a certainly a very strong I'm going to call it a myth in the in the wool industry that older sheep the wool goes funny. Um, my experience is that it doesn't. So that was good news for me. Uh, because you know that's that's really what I'm now uh, growing and selling, but also um, uh, the other thing that's that that happens in terms of this is the sheep demographics change, of course. So whereas you would normally have sheep from lamb to seven years old, now you've got sheep from lambs to twelve. I'm I'm guessing twelve is going to be sort of the average age. I don't know, <laughs> um, but that means that in any given year you're unlike you're, conventionally you're recycling or you're you're selling like 20 percent of your of your older sheep and then um maybe three quarters of your lamb crop and then that's your steady state so so 20 percent of your animals if you had 20 percent of your animals dying every year that's a fair few carcasses to deal with and figure out between but when you stretch out the demographics then it's only maybe between five and eight percent depends on how long they live so that's much more manageable and what um what the plan is that um i will actually bury them individually in sort of auger holes and plant trees over the top of them so that they will become uh they'll become the fertilizer for the <laughs> tree restoration projects. Huh. So um, yeah, so I think that's, you know, that feels really good. That's like, okay, yeah, we're taking them back into the system and their molecules stay here. Um, but then there's the whole set of issues around the health the, of older sheep. So now I'm into sheep geriatric health. <laughs> yeah, you were telling and, me before you have sunburn issues with your older sheep. Yes, yeah, so the oldest sheep, uh, and actually the sheep can get the skin cancer at any age um and that's that actually circles back to the trees because there's not a lot of shade on most of these grassland properties certainly not on mine and sheep like to uh, rest in the middle of the day at the top of a hill and there really aren't a lot of trees at tops of hills so my feeling is that if i could get better shade where they want to be in the middle of the day that um i could keep that skin damage um, to a minimum. So uh, so the sheep that die are going to contribute to the shade for the sheep <laughs> that are still <laughs> yeah. alive. Um, yeah, so, but there's also, you know, there's, there's just things that happen as sheep age that I didn't know much about. Uh, happily for me, I've got a wonderful vet. And so when something crops up, we go, okay, well, let's figure it out. Rather than the default position, honestly, Elizabeth, is if sheep doesn't look like it's quite right, you kill it. You don't call a vet. You just go, well, okay, never mind. That's but that's not an option for me. So it's like, well, no, let's figure it out. Mm -hmm. So uh, recently, I've, I've got a sheep that must be she must be about eight now or nine. I think she's nine. Her name is Difficult Girl <laughs> uh, because she is. And she just started going downhill and no obvious reason. That wasn't worms, it wasn't, you know. So we took a blood sample. I've never taken a blood sample from a sheep before. And when they analyzed it, it turns out she has an ulceration in her stomach, not in her rumen, but in her stomach. We don't know the cause, but there appears to be a bacterial element of it because she's responded pretty well to an antibiotic. But so it's, you know, it's kind of at this point, it's about developing knowledge and learning uh, what the what the issues are. Um, arthritis is going to be another one. And there are things that we can um, give the sheep for that. But, you know, just like the the main the easiest one is a is a powder that you put in their feed, but they don't eat feed. I mean, they yeah, don't eat. They they eat the grass. So how you administer that is going to be interesting. So it's just, there's a whole set of issues around the sheep geriatrics and also a bit like humans, you know, when, how do you know when it's time to euthanize a sheep? Um, you know, when, when is the quality of life 
diminished to the point where it's time. And that's all, that's never an easy call. You just have to work with each individual animal um, and go, okay. Like Alice finally just couldn't stand anymore. And um, Alice came into my life because she couldn't stand. <laughs> She'd had a really bad lambing and she was cast for probably 24 hours before I found her. So, but she wanted to live. You can usually tell when an animal wants to live. So I, I got a, an aluminum sling for her, kind of a cross piece thing. And every morning I'd get her up, put her in the sling because she couldn't walk and I'd pull her along to where she could graze plants. Um, and she would, she'd eat and then she'd look up at me like, can we move now? And I'd move her. <laughs> So I, I would spend like an hour or two a day with her doing this. And so I was watching her and I realized she was eating specific plants and, and a sheep can't see what they're eating because their eyes are sideways, right? So she had to be doing it by smell, but she would go in and she'd pick a particular plant out of the mix. Um, this was a pasture with oh maybe 10 species in it. Um, and she was eating, so she was eating individual plants and she was eating them in a specific order. And I watched her do it day after day after day. I thought, what on earth? And I, I didn't figure it out. I just kind of held that idea in my head. And then when I came across Fred's research, I went, that's it. <laughs> she's, she's eating, she's choosing which plants out of the lot she wanted. And, and, and at the time, and I think probably because she was getting better, she was um, you know, healing, that healing process, she was not the least bit interested in grass. So she would eat every broadleaf plant within reach. And then she'd look up at me like, you know, can we move now? And I'd move her and then she'd go through the process again. So yeah, so that's why she was special. But I promised her when I let her out of that sling that I would never put her back in again. So at the end when she just couldn't get up, it was like, no, it's time. Yeah, no, oh, that's a yeah. Good, wonderful story. But I, yeah, anyways, I wanted to ask you, and you mentioned them already that you have around 20 sheep that all have names and you already explained mm -hmm. that you also monitor them for their wool but also when I watch the videos when you are out on your farm you always say oh there's uh, I don't well remember the names but then oh, you Freddy, always recognize Freddy, them. Yeah, yeah. yeah you yep. recognize them but they also come up to you and greet you and so tell me how this all developed with these sheep <laughs> and <laughs> uh, okay um actually I'll tell you today uh yesterday I had a rough day yesterday I lost a sheep that I don't know why. And um, I had water problems and I had, I, I, there were a lot of things that happened in the day. And at the end of the day, I went to move the sheep. Um, and uh, one of the sheep that I just love, one of the named sheep is Elf is his name. And he came up out of the flock. He's quite shy. Um, he came right up to me and he just like, looked at me and he said, mom, I think you need a kiss. You know, <laughs> obviously you're not, you're not feeling very good. And I'm like, oh, thank you, Elf. I really needed that. Um, they won't do it. They won't do that if the dogs are close by, you know, they, they, they get too um, tense. But so the basic connection is the family, um, the mother progeny thing, because the one, two, three, there's about seven of them who were bottle lambs. So I fed them, I'm their mom, I will be their mother all their lives or as long as I live. Um, and so they will come up to me kind of no matter what. Some of them, you know, will come up and untie my shoelaces or chew on my pants or whatever. Um, Elfie wasn't, he wasn't a bottle lamb. He wouldn't take a bottle from me. He had um, infantile arthritis. And so he, he was walking just on, it's like on one elbow. Um, he was really crippled, but we got him through that and did some physiotherapy on him. And he, you wouldn't know now he's not very big, but he's, he's a, he's a canny little um, animal, but he was with four of my pet lambs. So he, he was with me, but he wouldn't, he, as a tiny lamb, he wouldn't come up to me. And it was only after the rest of them, he and the other ones went into the flock. Maybe a few months later, he started coming up to me. So I'm not really sure how, how the relationship, that part of the relationship works. But then one of the bottle lambs is Vicky and she's got 
boyfriends. She has lots of boyfriends. <laughs> just have any girlfriends except Clara, who was a pet with her. But she just seems to all the boys just like Vicky and Vicky likes me. So Vicky would hang out with me and the boys would hang out with me that her boyfriends. And so I ended up giving them names for various reasons. One of her one of her close boyfriends is uh, um, Albert, who's very sort of chilled out. It's amazing, <laughs> just chill. And another one is uh, Leo. And Leo just loves, he's got a real sense of curiosity and particularly he loves the the side-by-side -side, um, farm vehicle. So he's Leo after Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> um, and he, he, like today, yesterday, he came up to me as well to say hello. Um, and so, yeah, th then, then there are some that aren't, that don't come up to me necessarily, but for some reason, they've distinguished themselves like difficult girl, it's always at the back of the flock, always fighting the dogs. Ah. So she, and the, the French shepherds, um, they, they have sort of three categories. These are the guys who move sheep through the Alps in summer in the common, uh, common ground. So that's the kind of model of shepherding that I took on. Um, and they describe three different types of sheep in a flock. They have the adventuresome ones, the difficult ones, and everybody else. <laughs> So that's how she got her name of difficult girl. Um, so yeah, there's, um, they might've come in for an operation and get a name as a result of that. Um, but mostly it's the pets and Vicky's boyfriends, <laughs> of which there are about six. Yeah, <laughs> but you say in some of your videos that because these sheep have a special relationship with you, they also kind of help you with your shepherding because they trust you and then they can convince the other sheep to follow? Or? Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. They they will often follow me. It's shepherding, you know, I think it's a lot like human leadership. Um, you, you, you get to be a, a lead sheep because you actually deliver the goods. So whatever, whatever the, the, the things are that the flock most needs. I have a theory that there are multiple leaders in the flock for different things. So one leader that I had um, was really good at moving the flock through gates, which was great for me because sheep will naturally stop at a gate and really, they really want to know it's safe because as soon as one goes, the rest are going to go. If there was danger, then they're all in danger. Um, but she was really good about that, but she wasn't very adventuresome in terms of foraging. Um, so I think there are others that were scouting food. Others are really good at remembering where all the water troughs are. Uh, so what I was trying to do in shepherding was to convince the flock that I was worth following. And so the way I would do that is I would go up to the front of the, normally I'm kind of at the back of the flock and letting them graze forward. But if we were going from uh, say a grass paddock into a lucerne paddock, which I was always pretty exciting for the sheep, I would move up to the front and then try to get them to follow me. And that's where the pets were invaluable because they'd go, oh, mom, oh, okay. Yeah, she doesn't have bottles anymore, but you know what? It's worth following her. So, um, and then the sheep would have the experience that by following me, they went to a place that was really useful. So yeah, the, the pets are really helpful in that way. There are times when they're not like going into the shed because they all circle back to me and don't want to go forward and I have to do stuff to get them <laughs> to go in. Yeah, and maybe that's one of my questions I had because you, when you explained how you actually got into this whole sheep business is because you were so interested and in also training your own shepherding dogs. Yep. And now I understood that sometimes you use your dogs and sometimes you don't. So like, yep. What's yep. The now, story um, there? <laughs> the, so one of the, you know, in the same, at the same point in time where I was really trying to find something more than patience in shepherding, my dogs were having to do the same thing. Because up to that point, when we went out to do anything with sheep, it was to move them more or less as fast as possible from point A to point B. When you're shepherding, it's 
absolutely the opposite. You don't want them under any stress because they won't eat if they're stressed. And the whole point of shepherding is for them to be eating on the way. So my dogs had a, my older dogs had a terrible time making this adjustment. And because they spend a lot of time just sitting or lying down, it's like, no, no, just leave it. Just leave it, just leave it. In fact, let's have a nap. Um, so eventually my two older dogs kind of got it and, and really liked it. Um, but the other thing is that, you know, sheep are, are really vigilant. So you cannot sneak up on a mob of sheep. If, if they don't want to know you, they will depart and you, know, you just don't ever think that you fooled them. They know <laughs> that you were there and they particularly know the, that a dog is there. So for instance, I really prefer to, to work my rams without a dog if I can. They're, they're, pretty, they're pretty chill as long as there's not a dog around and they kind of know the drill. So um, uh, I, I guess the other part too is I've gotten much better at being a sheepdog. So I know more about how to um, convince sheep to move where I want them to move, uh, e either in a larger scale sense or in a, you know, sort of in the, in the shed kind of movements. And so uh, like with my hospital sheep, I wouldn't put a dog anywhere near them because it's, they're stressed enough. And um, so if it takes me half an hour to walk them 150 yards, so be it that's, you know, that's going to be much better for me, the sheep, and in fact, the dog, because I'm going to be on the dog's case all the time if the dog's trying to do um, more than I want him to. Um, my, the main dog I use now, Pearl, has finally, well, actually, for some time now, has really accepted that many times I just simply want her to sit and hold position at the back of the flock. I'll go up to the front of the flock, and she doesn't put excess pressure on it like for going through a gate or something like that so but but even pearl i wouldn't put i don't even take her down when i'm working with the hospital sheep mm -hmm. so yeah it's i mean i occasionally i'll be out without a dog and want to move sheep through a gate and if i'm lucky i might get it but more likely i won't if it's not where the sheep want to go then like go back and get a dog uh, sometimes i can do it I always try if I, you know, it's like easier to at least give it a try. So, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it is kind of funny because the, all the sort of uh, precision stuff that I was, that I was taught and tried to learn how to do for trials, for dog trials, most of it doesn't matter at all. If I've got a dog that will flank either side, will go around the back when I ask them to, and will mostly will sit down and stay still, then that's what I need. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. It's a more relaxed job than for the dog as well. <laughs> it is too. It actually is. Um, border collies tend to be pretty intense. You know that they're, yeah. uh, they're bred for that. But you can you can uh, you can get them to chill a bit. Right? <laughs> yeah, and and I mean it's I think normal probably that um, rams are together and not with the rest of the flock. But I understood that late you, you the rams are are not meeting the use any longer no, because that's right. you sa decided not to have your own lambs anymore. Yeah, that was a really major uh, decision for me because I've put so much emphasis on mothers and babies um, and also on essentially having a closed flock. So, um, but, but for a, a number of reasons, I decided this was a time to at least do the experiment. So I'm, it's, at this stage is formally an experiment of buying lambs from the people that I've got my genetics from, um, which is Glenn Stewart, Alan and Carol Phillips in the Northern part of Tasmania. So these lambs will blend in perfectly with, um, with my wool. And although they do dock tails, they don't mules, but um, they agreed to leave the tails on for the lambs I'm buying from them. So I've got um, undocked tails, so that's good. And um, the, the, probably the main driver for me is just my age. Um, I'm 16, I'll be 69 in a couple of months and I want to keep on doing this farming for a long time. So 
lambing is like the last really physically demanding thing left that I struggle with. And so I thought, well, maybe I don't need to do that for 25 lambs every couple of years, which is sort of the rate at which I'm lambing. And, um, but the other thing is I probably, I wouldn't have done that unless I was pretty confident that the flock is now locally adapted. So even though they won't have mothers, they'll have lots of peers to help them get adapted to this environment, uh, which is different from the environment that they were born into and that their mothers, um, you know, the gestation, um, what mamas eat also influences the baby's choices after they're born. So they're experiencing those chemicals um, through the uterine wall. Um, so yeah, so I, I think I think they'll thrive. I'm reasonably sure that they will. Um, one of the things I'm doing though is I've got the named sheep, I've separated the named sheep out into a little flock so that I can put the lambs with the named sheep and spend time with them. So I'm trying to get the name sheep to teach the lambs that I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that'll be, that's another experiment. But um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. One of the things that it's letting me do is to choose only boys. So um, over time, that will make my management, um, particularly fly management, much easier because boys have much less tendency to get fly struck than girls. So you know, give me 12 years, 12 years or so, I should have a predominantly male flock, weather flock, which, which will be nice. <laughs> yeah, Nan and the, and the boys, the sheep boys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and my last question, uh, um, because also we've been going on for quite some time now, um, I'd really enjoy how you like on your Instagram account and also I see a lot of videos also on your website and I really like how you like it's not every morning but I imagine you know you're out and about and you're doing something and you just take the video and then you just explain something yeah today we're trying to get the sheep from there to there because we need to have these weeds uh eaten up and that's important or and and you explain a little bit about what you do like what motivates you to share these small stories um with your audience yeah I, look it's a really good question and i will say that when i started selling the yarn um there were two things that people told me one was i had to have a blog and the second was that i had to do social media and i went no i don't <laughs> That's your uh, number one response. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> no, no, I don't have to. And um, partly it came from, uh, I really, I personally dislike being marketed, you know, having marketing come at me. And so I just didn't want to do that to my customers. It's like, if you want to, if you're, if you're intrigued with the story and you like the product, come and buy it. But I'm not going to be out there, you know, with holding you by the lapels. So, so what I had to do then was to think, well, what would I like to do instead of marketing? And so with the blog, what I decided was I would only write a blog when I was inspired. I wouldn't write it on any kind of time frame. And, um, and in fact, at one point I took a whole year off. I just got burned out. I'd said most of what I needed to say at that point. And mm -hmm. um, so I just said, I, I'll be back when I've got something else to say. <laughs> Um, and then with the with Instagram, I don't like Facebook and I don't like Twitter. Neither one did anything for me. But I like the I'm very visual, so I like the photos of uh, on Instagram. But I didn't. Again, I really didn't want to sort of be pushing the yarn. I wanted to let people enter into a little bit into the experience that I have, which is just so much fun basically. And so occasionally just excruciatingly beautiful and other times funny, um, you know, so, so that's I, what I decided to do was I wanted to do my Instagram posts essentially in real time. I didn't want them to be things that I um, uh, sort of uh, structured or mm -hmm. designed in any way. And so if something strikes me, then, oh, okay, let's do that. 
Um, and usually it's, you know, it's first photo or the second photo or the, you know, the first video if I get the sound right. I have a lot of trouble with sound in Instagram. I don't know why. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll record something. It's like nearly a minute and I've done a beautiful explanation and there wasn't even any wind noise. And somehow I didn't get the sound. It's like, oh, oh it really annoys me. <laughs> Um, okay, so yeah, so it's just, um, you know, uh, like, I think the last one I posted was trees in the fog that I just, they just, it just really caught my eye. And I, I actually took another photo, which I didn't post that morning, but was uh, spider webs that were showing up because of the dew. And there was actually, you know, spider right in the middle of it. Um, I guess what I feel is that, um, the images themselves and uh, a fairly sparse, like I almost never write much caption. That's partly, <laughs> that's partly because I don't have my glasses <laughs> when I'm out because I only wear glasses for reading. And so I don't dare write anything very long because there'll be uh, typos <laughs> in it. And I'm squinting at it, you know, trying to go, did I actually say that? Yeah, okay, I think that's okay. I don't think I said anything <laughs> stupid. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so the the voiceover on the videos is probably the main way that um, that I communicate uh, what's happening in there. But yeah, you know, I I I really enjoy uh, the po doing the posts, and it feels it just feels right in the sense of it's it is marketing in the sense that it keeps bringing the name back to people, but it's not because it's not you know hitting people over the head with the products. No, I, as I said, I really enjoyed it because it, it shows how much, I mean, also our conversation now shows, shows how much uh, thinking goes into everything that you do. And, and but it, it gives this kind of behind the scenes or and, and these details that like a normal consumer like me wouldn't think that that's actually a yeah. thing to think about but then it, it's so amazing <laughs> that there is so much attention to detail necessary to to make this beautiful wool product so that's why I really yeah enjoy. I think it's it's a it is sort of a mindfulness isn't quite the right word you know it comes back to the thoughtful animal welfare mm -hmm. the whole thing is 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 an exercise in thoughtfulness and um, you know, like I was saying earlier, I don't always get it right, but I'm always working to to try to make sure that I'm paying attention to the things that need paying attention to. And yeah. and then it's fun to share, you know, as otherwise it's me and the dogs and the cat and the sheep. Um, not that I don't have friends and you know, other things <laughs> that I do in life, but, but my working day is, um, you know, it's mostly solitary in that sense. And so um, one of the things I've started doing, uh, I, was, I keep a farm journal, you know, which is what I did and any sheep that had treatments and, you know, that sort of stuff. And I've started um, a new little category at the end of the day, which is, which I call gifts, because pretty much every time I go out on the farm, the farm gives me something if I'm paying attention. So uh, this morning's gift was a wombat on mm -hmm. the hill that I see to the south of my house. And he's just kind of, you know, they, I don't know if you've ever watched a wombat yeah, move, but they I look have, like, yeah. they look kind of like little tanks and they don't look like they could move very fast. And he didn't for a while. And then he just, they can go really fast. Honestly, <laughs> they could be Olympic sprinters. He just went <laughs> and took <laughs> off down the hill. So those are, I guess, in a way that that's those sorts of things when I can capture them on camera that um, I enjoy being able to share with people who are interested yeah wonderful yeah. well thank you so much for sharing your story also on the wool academy podcast if people want to find out more about what you do where what is your website where should they go it's called white gum wool all one word um dot com dot au great i'll also make sure to link to that and yeah I, i'll be following you for sure and i really enjoyed our conversation thank you so much Thank you, Elizabeth. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. Bye. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I stopped the okay. recording. So I do hope you enjoyed my conversation with Nan. Um, and if you want to find out more, then head on over to the show notes at elizabethvanderden.com slash forward slash one two six so 126. And as I said, also go and check out Nan's website 
you can find it at whitegummovie.com.au. I will be taking a short break um, and I hope to return very soon, but work is kind of crazy at the moment. So I do apologize in advance that episodes won't be launching as regularly. Also, this is already a little bit late. Um, I do appreciate you listening and if you also have ideas or people I should interview, please do get in contact with me through my website and I will do my best to return to more regular timings. But in the meantime, I thank you for your understanding. So talk to you again very soon. Bye for now.